So when I consider Leonardo da Vinci, the ultimate Renaissance man, probably one of the greatest multitaskers of all time who brought to us uh, incredible amounts of inventions and um, pieces of artwork and scientific discoveries. My favourite quote from the great man is, I have wasted my hours. <laughs> For some reason, I find this very, very comforting. Now, our next speaker that we're about to hear from, I think, uh, derives a great deal more than that quote from, um, from Leonardo da Vinci. He's the world's leading authority on applying uh, da Vinci's uh, genius to self-development and he's asked all kinds of questions about creativity, whether it can be learned and I guess a good question to ask the ultimate multitasker is how do you do it all? Michael Gelb is author of 12 books on accelerated learning and creativity including Think Like Da Vinci, Seven Steps to Genius Every Day and somewhat encouragingly Wine Drinking for Inspired Thinking. Please welcome Michael Gelb to the stage. Buongiorno, buongiorno. So that was a lovely introduction, but I'd like to tell you about the first time I was introduced to speak about Leonardo da Vinci. It was in the early 90s, and I was speaking to a group of company presidents on the subject of creativity and innovation. And This is a very demanding group of people. They pay a lot of money to come to these events. When you talk to them, they usually have five or six other events going on at the same time. And if they don't like you, they just get up and walk out and go hear somebody else. I've seen people start with big audiences of hundreds of people. And after five minutes, they only have a few close friends. Anyway. I was lucky enough to speak to this group and I was thrilled to be in Washington, D.C. But I knew that they were holding one of these premier events in Florence, which is my favorite city. And for me, a big part of happiness is La Dolce Vita. So I wanted to get invited to Florence. So I imagined a scenario. I imagine that the education chair for Florence might approach me after my talk, and he'd probably ask me something along the lines of, you know, if we were to invite you to Florence, what would you do? We'd want something really special because everyone wants to go to Florence. Do you ever have anything happen in your life where you imagine a scenario and it comes true exactly as you envisioned it? I gave my talk to the presidents on creativity innovation. I was relieved that no one left. Sure enough, gentleman approaches me afterwards. He looks at me, he says, I'm the education chair for Florence. He said, if we were to invite you, what would you do? He said, We'd some, we want something really special because everybody wants to go to Florence. Well, I looked him right in the eye and I said, how about how to think like Leonardo da Vinci? And he said, can you really do that? And I said, sure. <laughs> we call this the chutzpah principle of intelligence. So I had six months to make it up. But the good news was, I wasn't just making it up out of thin air because Leonardo da Vinci was one of my childhood heroes along with Superman. And I remember when I discovered that Superman was just a comic book character, but Leonardo was real. And the more I learned about him, the more amazing he seemed to be. He seemed to embody all of our human potential. So this was my opportunity. I went to the place where Leonardo was born, and I went to the place where he died. I literally walked in his footsteps and aim to see the world from his point of view. I read his notebooks over and over again. I interviewed the world's great leading uh, Da Vinci scholars. I went to the great museums of the world and contemplated his 
magnificent works. I started dreaming about him lucidly. <laughs> and from those dreams, seven principles emerged. People say to me, you know, did you come up with the seven principles because it's a good number for marketing? You know, that book, The Seven Habits, that did pretty well. You know, the research on the magic number seven, plus or minus two, it's the limit of short-term memory. But the truth is, I tried to find an eighth principle. I couldn't do it. I tried to consolidate down to six. No way. There happened to be seven principles for thinking like Leonardo da Vinci, irreducible and complete. So that summer, I wrote up a paper about the seven principles, and I sent it in to the committee introducing me along with my biography. Well, the person introducing me confused the two documents, leading to the most memorable introduction I've ever received. It went like this. Ladies and gentlemen, members and guests, here at the Young President's Organization, we have had many extraordinary resources over the years, but never have I had the privilege and pleasure of introducing a speaker with a resume like this. Anatomist, architect, botanist, city planner, designer, engineer, painter, sculptor, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Gell. <laughs> at the Institute for the Achievement of Human Potential in Philadelphia. Dr. Glenn Doman and his colleagues have been doing pioneering work in applied neuroplasticity. Specifically, they've worked with brain-damaged children to help them recover function. They've been doing this for over 30 years. And Doman tells a story of a young boy who was, was sent to the clinic prognosis at the time was pretty grim. They said he'd never function normally. He'd certainly never learned to read. Dome and his team worked with the boy and his family for about a year and a half, and he was functioning pretty well. He learned to read. He was reading two years above his grade level in school. People stepped back and said, wait a minute, if a brain-damaged child is capable of reading two years above their level in school, what is the average child capable of? Doman wrote that every child is born with the genius capacity of a Leonardo da Vinci. But he added, we go about de-geniusing them. So in the next 24 minutes, we're going to have a re-geniusing session. And we'll begin with the first principle for thinking like Leonardo da Vinci. It's one you're already applying by coming to this magnificent conference. The first principle for thinking like Leonardo da Vinci is curiosita. Curiosita. I want everybody to say it with a really big, powerful gesture all together. Curiosita. E molto bene, grazie. What does it mean? Curiosity. Leonardo da Vinci was probably the most curious person who ever lived. What was he curious about? Everything. He wanted to know truth. He wanted to know beauty. He wanted to know goodness. When people criticize Leonardo for leaving a lot of things unfinished. And Freud wrote a book about Leonardo. He said he had trouble being mindful and paying attention, following through. <laughs> Traced it back to childhood issues. I, I have another theory as to why Leonardo left things unfinished. And it's about who Leonardo was competing with. Because people say, well, Leonardo was in competition with Michelangelo. No. <laughs> Leonardo's standard of excellence and creativity was the divine. He was comparing what he was doing to divine creation. He was trying to imitate the divine in his work. That's a fairly high standard. So maybe we can understand why, why he left a few things incomplete. So 
Have you seen the, the notebooks of Leonardo? We'll put, it, put them up. You can see them on the, the screen here. This is a shot of some of Leonardo's notebooks. You know, scholars criticize Leonardo because they said his notebooks were disorganized, no table of contents, no index. He goes on w from one subject to another, refraction of, of light, the flow of water, flight of a bird. And on that same page, he jots down some jokes and a shopping list. They said, boy, too bad this guy wasn't more organized. Just think what he could have done. <laughs> what you're seeing in the notebooks is the process of a mind that is completely free and passionately curious to understand the divine essence of the universe. So his curiosita took him up into the sky. Do you know about his plans for a flying machine, the helicopter, and maybe his most amazing invention of all, the parachute. Leonardo da Vinci invented the parachute before anybody could fly. That's thinking ahead, isn't it? And a, a British skydiver actually built Leonardo's parachute out of material that was available in Leonardo's time. He went 10,000 feet up in a hot air balloon in a, over the plains in Africa. He had a modern parachute on for backup, but he didn't need it because Leonardo's parachute actually worked. His curiosita took him underneath the oceans. You know about his plans for a submarine, a diving bell, and the snorkel? The extendable ladder that fire departments still use today, the concept of the ball bearing, the notion of automation, the three-speed gear shift all first appear in the notebooks of Leonardo. So what can you do to deepen your own curiosita? Well, you can do just what Leonardo did and keep a notebook. Keep a notebook or a journal. How many people already do this? You already keep a notebook or a journal. How many people have to do writing, business writing for your job or if you're in school, you have to do writing for school? That kind of writing has to have a beginning, middle, and end, doesn't it? There are negative consequences if someone else doesn't approve of how you've been thinking. That's the proverbial box that everyone wants to get out of. <laughs> and the secret is to do just what Leonardo did. It's to keep a personal notebook. You know he wrote backwards so that prying eyes wouldn't be able to invade the sanctity of what he was thinking. He wanted to keep it personal. It was to reflect his own mind, his curious observations about the nature of reality. Hey, where are, you, where are you physically located when you get your best ideas? Where are you actually physically located? Right, who's in the shower? Who's resting in bed? Who's doing loving kindness meditation? <laughs> who's out in nature? Who's at a serious business meeting? <clears throat> what's, <laughs> what's happening? What's happening in the shower? or the meditation, or in nature, that tends not to happen in the meeting. You're relaxed. You're completely relaxed, and your mind is free. You start to think in a nonlinear, playful fashion. Well, it turns out that one of the big differences between the great geniuses of history and average people great genius of history like Leonardo. This is one of these things that happens to be true of just about every genius throughout human history. They all keep a notebook, and they all write down fairly random things that occur to them, and they do lots of creative doodling to illustrate it. So they wake up with a wacky off-the-wall idea at 4 o'clock in the morning, they put it in their notebook. Average person wakes up with a wacky off-the-wall idea at 4 o'clock in the morning, they think, hey, I'm no genius, and they go back to sleep. Study at Stanford University. People improve their creative thinking ability immediately on the standard test of, of creativity when they change their idea about their own 
self-identity vis-a-vis creativity. In other words, people who think that they are creative start to pay attention to their creative ideas, and guess what happens? They get more creative. Who are the most curious people that you know? Little children. See, this is our birthright. We're born with curiosity. So to stimulate it, to nurture it through your adult life, give reverence to those flights of your imagination by recording them. And I was thinking about Curiosita and this fabulous conference and these amazing speakers and this brilliant information. And we're, in, we're coming to the uh, second half of the last day. So, wow, it's powering in there. So I want a, a question for you to start your notebook with to take away and, and contemplate of everything you're learning or relearning for you at this time in your life right now, what's the very greatest point of leverage for happiness? What's the one thing that you could either start to do or stop doing that would deeply enrich your life? Second principle for thinking like Leonardo da Vinci is dimostrazione. Everybody, dimostrazione. Make a little gesture. I like this gesture. Dimostrazione. Let me hear you. I can't hear you. Dimostrazione. Fantastico. Great. And could we change the slide, please? So this is Leonardo's image of the child in the womb, the embryo in the womb. It's the first accurate drawing ever done. He wanted to know the very secret of life. This is the original drawing of the parachute. And these are Leonardo's three views of a flower. Dimostrazione. It's a term Leonardo himself used to refer to the importance of demonstrating things in your own experience. He said, you must become an inventore, an original thinker. What was the challenge to original thinking in Leonardo's time besides the strictures of the church? Hard to get information. Books were rare. If you could find one, what language would it be in? Latin, which you wouldn't have learned unless you were a noble or a cleric. What's the challenge to independent thinking now. Too much information. How do you cut through the tsunami of spam to really think for yourself? A lot of people confuse cynicism with independent thinking. Cynics, I have compassion for cynics. They're broken-hearted idealists. I get a lot of them in my, especially my corporate classes. I try, I work really hard to turn them into skeptics. Leonardo's method for cultivating our dimostrazioni, the clue is in these three views of a flower. Because he says, learn to look at different perspectives. Every time he sketches anything, he does it from different angles. When he does dissections, He's the first in history we know of to do the dissections from three different angles. He says, embrace multiple perspectives to say that you've really thought about it. Third principle for thinking like Leonardo. We say this one with an uplifting helicopter-like gesture. Sensazione. Everybody, sensazione. What does it mean? Sensation. Leonardo said the five senses are the ministers of the soul. He trained his sensory awareness like an Olympic athlete trains their body for competition. But do you know what he wrote 500 years ago in Tuscany? 500 years ago in Tuscany, Leonardo wrote that the average person looks without seeing, hears without listening, touches without feeling eats without tasting, breathes in without awareness of aroma or fragrance, and talks without thinking. That was 500 years ago in Tuscany before the Kardashians. 
<laughs> and Leonardo's guidance for us to sharpen our senses, because he believes that as we appreciate beauty mindfully, we nurture it in our own soul. I was thinking, you know, one of the themes that's arisen is this, this sense of intrinsic seeing and then the hedonic experience. You've heard that term. Hedonism means pleasure. So the pleasure that can be out there seems to be outside of us. But sensazione brings them together. It's looking for the deep, true beauty in your life. And the Italians do understand this. You know, they have la dolce vita, the sweet, soulful life, which is about being present in the moment with beauty. And the French have it too, joie de vivre, the joy of living. We have trouble in the States. All we have is happy hour. <laughs> so, so Leonardo, this is, this is a painting. It's in the Uffizi Gallery. Part of your follow-up field trip assignment from our session today is to go to the Uffizi and see this. Leonardo's teacher, Verrocchio, did this bit, and it wasn't unusual in those days for a master like Verrocchio to say to a promising young apprentice like Leonardo, touch up the angel in the corner for me. So Leonardo painted this angel. And when Verrocchio came back and saw it, Vasari, the first art historian, tells us he would never touch colors again. Now, the romantic interpretation of this is he was so moved by his student's gift that he just couldn't paint. The more realistic business interpretation is he said, aha, I can now delegate the painting department to the young Leonardo. I can concentrate on the more profitable practice of sculpture. But the lesson that Leonardo shares with us here is a powerful one. I think it, it sums up, for me, the theme of, of the marvelous inspiration that I've received being here the last couple of days. Because if you look, if you look at Verrocchio's angel, Verrocchio's angel looks a bit like a bored choir boy. You know, this painting is called The Baptism of Christ. He's looking out the other direction, saying, like, Baptism of Christ, whatever. Just fill out the paperwork. Whereas <laughs> Leonardo's angel is looking as though, this, hey, this is a miracle, which is, after all, the subject of the painting. And it was another genius, Einstein, who said there are two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. Fourth principle for thinking like the maestro. And we're going to do a really cool gesture for this one. If we can get the uh, next slide, please. So we've gone. Nope, we're going in the wrong direction. So this uh, gesture, one more. There we are. Thank you very much. Grazie mille. Big round of applause for the people back there who are sorting this all out. <laughs> Woo! Thank you. The fourth principle for thinking like Leonardo is sfumato. Fumato. So let's make this gesture, your left hand on your heart, right hand pointing up to heaven but across your body, and say, sfumato, sfumato, molto bene. Sfumato is a term that art critics coined to refer to the hazy, mysterious quality in Leonardo da Vinci's paintings. And what it represents for us is maybe the most distinguishing characteristic of highly creative people. And that is their willingness to embrace the unknown. And perhaps the supreme and sublime symbol of Sfumato, the Mona Lisa. What is she smiling about? What is she smiling about? Well, let's find out. Everybody, please assume the Mona position. Assume the Mona position. Now, I'd like you, please, to imitate her famous smile. Now, hold your Mona smile as you look around at the people near you to see who has a really good Mona smile without cracking up. I'm expecting great Mona smiles at the happiness conference. <laughs> Fabulous. Well done. <laughs> How does it make you feel to smile like Mona? Well, 
I was lucky enough a little while ago to do a seminar for 80 gifted children ages 8 to 11. And I asked them, what is Mona Lisa smiling about? And without my even asking them to do it, they imitated her smile because they have curiosita. And they were really into it. And one of the kids says, she's got a secret. <laughs> and then another kid said, yeah, she knows that everything has an opposite. And then the kids start saying opposites like light and dark, night and day, good and bad, boys and girls, life and death. I asked my average corporate group a while ago, somebody said, I read in the Wall Street Journal that the famous smile was caused by a dental problem. <laughs> <laughs> See, the kids got it right. Mona is the Western equivalent of the ancient symbol of yin and yang, which tells us that the harmony... The secret of life is in that harmony, that balance of the apparent opposite. Which brings us to the fifth principle. Everybody, big gestures. Arte, everybody, arte scienza. And arte means art. Scienza means science. Leonardo st said, study the science of art and the art of science. So this Mona Lisa, you know it is a masterpiece of art, but it's one of the great works of science. It's predicated on a profound study of proportion and mathematics, of anatomy, geology, botany, the nature of the flow of water before the sciences for these things actually really existed as we understand them today. In contemporary terms, we say integrate, use your whole brain. Use your whole brain. The next principle for thinking like Leonardo da Vinci is coming up in a minute, but first I want you to see this. So you know Leonardo's self-portrait, Mona Lisa, the proportions are exactly identical. Next principle, corporalita, everybody. Corporalita. It represents the idea of integrating the body and the mind. Leonardo is renowned as the strongest man in Florence. He gives advice on health and wellness that's timeless. He says, learn to preserve your own health. Avoid grievous moods and keep your mind cheerful. Eat healthy, wholesome food. He himself was a vegetarian in Renaissance Italy, highly unusual. He says, have a little red wine with dinner. He was also renowned for his poise and grace and elegance in movement. I don't know if you're familiar with the Alexander technique. It comes from Australia, but it's one of the most marvelous ways to facilitate this quality of corporalita. And then... We come to the seventh principle for thinking like Leonardo. Connezione. Everybody. Connezione. Everything connects to everything else. So here's Leonardo's adoration of the Magi. Here's the holy figure, serene in the center. See the chaos as you get away from the center, your divine alignment. Here's youth looking away. Here's an old philosopher. Youth, age, timelessness when we're centered in our deepest purpose and highest value. We see the same theme in another masterpiece, The Last Supper. Leonardo, she's the first painter to capture the moment where Christ says, one of you shall betray me. It's the moment of highest tension. It's also a great dramatic moment. It's kind of like tune in next week to see what happened. <laughs> so is that an M that represents uh, Mary Magdalene? Was Leonardo a member of the Priory of Sion? Of course not. He was trying to discover science. If you believe that it's M that stands for Mary Magdalene, you'll believe it's an M that stands for millions of copies sold. No. 
There's a more powerful spiritual message here, though. Students of Leonardo know that one of his favorite images was the image of a stone tossed into a still pond. You ever watch the water ripple out and wonder where it goes? 500 years ago, Leonardo wrote that when a tiny bird alights on the branch of a tree, the whole world is affected thus. Everything connects to everything else. So here what he's telling us is in this moment, Christ says, one of you shall betray me. It prefigures the resurrection, a moment like a stone tossed into the pond of eternity that will ripple out forever and change human destiny. And again, you notice this theme. If you're in the center, if you're aligned with your highest purpose, you're serene. You see, the, the disciples are, oh, my God, who could it be? What happened? The holy figures aligned and centered. So here's a little, can we just go back to the previous one, please? Here's a little summary of what we just talked about. You can copy this note down. It's a mind map created by my good friend Tony Buzan, uh, the concept of mind mapping. I actually made this mind map to summarize this talk for you. What does the parachute represent? Thinking ahead, right? You see the Da Vinci man in the center? So, curiosita, what's the greatest point of leverage in your life for happiness? Demonstrazione, cultivate your independent thinking. Sensazione, embrace la dolce vita. Sfumato, smile like the Mona Lisa. Arte scienza, use your whole brain. Corporalità, integrate body and mind. And connezione, everything connects to everything else. The art critic Bernard Berenson said of Leonardo da Vinci that everything he touched turned to eternal beauty. My wish for you is that you'll take these seven principles and bring a touch of that beauty to your life every single day. Grazie mille.